core to the rostrum. So ideally, what you should be able to do is fold these graphs in half and, and they match, they're a mirror image. So we're getting two good copies of the entire life history of each fish. And the top graph here in black, this is the strontium stable isotope ratio. And you can see here on this graph that there's, it's kind of faint, um, a line where the Mohawk River stable isotope, uh, strontium isotope signature lies. And above that, the green dashed line is where the Hudson River strontium isotope signature lies. Um, I did not include on this where the ocean isotope value lies because it's kind of confusing. It's really close to the Mohawk River. In fact, this part right here is an oceanic signal, and I'll get back to that. But uh, right, this one unfortunately is a little offset, I apologize, the, through the core. And this is compared to, uh, in blue, the strontium calcium ratio from the LAS BMS and the barium calcium ratio in red. And I included those because the, the strontium isotope ratio values can often be kind of hard to interpret. And if it, <coughs> they're all over the place, and you'll see that. Um, comparing these graphs to these graphs help me make sure what I'm looking at is actually a real value. And then comparing that to the strontium barium just makes those differences between strontium and barium uh, bigger and easier to see. So what I've basically seen in uh, almost 200 odalists that I've been able to analyze, analyze at this point is um, roughly four main groups in what the blueback herring of the Mohawk River have been doing. And this is the first one. And what I've been calling these is the early out migrators. And here I want to draw your attention to the red line here. And that's drawing your, ooh, that's drawing your attention to this kind of peak pointing up towards the Hudson River. That's when this fish came from the Mohawk River, went and hatched, went up to the Hudson, and then went out to the ocean. And then it came back, I know, to the Mohawk River, because that's where Scott Mills caught it. <laughs> Compare that to a late out migrator. Now watch where this red line goes in the next slide. It shifted to the right. It's gone out. <clears throat> about three to 500 microns in the entire length of the otolith. And this is the same information, the strontium ratio, strontium calcium in blue, barium in red, and then barium calcium in purple down at the bottom. This one is, is pretty clear. Again, this is a Mohawk fish, went out to the Hudson, and then out to the ocean. High strontium calcium ratios, indicate higher salinity, it definitely went out to higher salinity. So pretty sure that's what's happening. The third group really threw me for a loop and there are quite a few of these. I looked at the oops, I looked at this and went, wait a minute, it didn't go anywhere. But then I compared it to the strontium calcium and there's a big rise in salinity on the outer edge. There's that drop to the ocean signature, but there's no peak for the Hudson. Now, I thought about this for a while and realized that we're looking at a fish here that we age as four years old. So you're looking at an otolith from age zero here at the core to age, oh no. Okay, <laughs> to, sorry, oh goodness sakes. To the age four where it was captured at the outside. And that's a long period of time in just a couple micrometers. And blueback herring can make the trip from Albany to New York City in two days. You're going to probably miss that signal. We just don't have the resolution with this kind of analysis. But we can be assured that it started out in the Mohawk and dropped down to the ocean. It did not fly there, I'm assuming. <laughs> so, the last group is, is the beautiful one. And these are evenly distributed. It's, it's almost 25% uh, of the fish that I've analyzed so far in each of these groups. And we've got the return migrators, and this one is just gorgeous. Started out in the Mohawk, up to the Hudson, down to the ocean. Up to the Hudson, 
it's past Schenectady. And uh, that's about 250, 300 kilometers from the ocean. Another part of the analysis that I'm working up with this is that we're looking at stable, uh, muscle stable isotopes. And uh, to do this, what, what this is showing me is uh, on the x-axis, this is the um, carbon stable isotopes. And on the y-axis is nitrogen stable isotopes. And uh, in yellow, the yellow circles are, well, let me start with the triangles. The triangles are from 2000. The yellow circles are from 2013. And the red diamonds are from 2016. And what this shows us is that the carbon values, which are pretty close together, not a real big difference in the carbon values, is uh, that's reflecting differences in food sources. Um, what you can see in differences in the carbon stable isotopes is uh, uh, you can see differences where you're finding fish in warmer water and they're choosing more littoral food items. And I, I had one of my pre-talk epiphanies last night, as, as one does, and realized that you know those 2013 fish are just weird. They've been pulling out weird in all of the analyses that I've been looking at. And that, like, it was warmer that year. It was a lot warmer that year. It was a low water. It was a high water year. Uh, and that was the ocean heat wave that Janet was talking about this morning. Uh, Captain. Yeah. One of the ladies this morning was talking about this morning. <laughs> and, and that would make sense according to the carbon isotopes here. The nitrogen isotopes are an indicator of the trophic role. And uh, this is where you can see maybe a focus on different zooplankton from different years. Um, we might be seeing here how blue back herring can be more opportunistic, what is more available to them from year to year. Uh, what, um, uh, and you know, that's a sign of, of resiliency. They, they have options. Um, I do have their stomachs. I do have the zooplankton associated with these. So talk to me next year, and I will have a better answer for that. Um, oh, <clears throat> and also, uh, this is some preliminary data on what I, I promised that I was going to do shortly. Uh, when I am able to micromill away the outer edge, the most recent otolith tissue, um, and send that away for oxygen stable isotope analysis. And I, I've, been able, I've been able to send out 16, and 14 of them came back with actual data, which was great. And what we hope to be able to do with this is to reconstruct the temperature history, the, the most recent oceanic temperature that the fish were exposed to. Um, this is the kind of information that we could use to help develop stock structures. Um, if we take this into account uh, with the differences in the migration patterns that we're seeing, we could maybe see <clears throat> even more differences in the stock structure. Uh, there is a relationship between the um, oxygen, which is on the y-axis, um, and temperature. It's an inverse relationship, um, which was confusing. It's like, so this is telling me that over the years that I did hear that they're being exposed to cooler temperature. Are we in global climate warming? Um, but. Uh, Oxygen stable isotopes can also indicate that they're, they tend to increase with the age of the fish. And uh, we very handily had a, a meeting about herring yesterday with uh, all the people who work on the Mohawk. And um, Scott Wells, or uh, it may have been actually Wes, who mentioned that the uh, age structure of the bluebacks in the Mohawk are expanding. So are we seeing, even in this, that over the few years of data that I've already been able to analyze, are we, are we seeing bigger and older fish? It's possible. So uh, given that this is just one of the many chapters of my dissertation that are on its way, um, <clears throat> I don't like to use the word conclusion quite yet. I'm not comfortable there. Um, so again, the, the objectives of what I was looking at for today um, can we, we can, we can separate fish from the Mohawk River from other parts of the watershed using those biogeochemical markers. We can pretty consistently 
um, recognize a mohawk fish versus a Hudson fish. Ultimately, what I would like to be able to do is see if I can tell the difference between a fish caught at Schenectady versus a fish caught at Rome, which is another 150 kilometers upstream. Um, I'm working on it. We'll see. Um, the trends of the migration patterns that we've been able to see so far in the Mohawk River are blue bass. Uh, whoop, um, I love Karen's statement from a couple years ago. There's a bewildering variety of blue bass herring migration patterns. Um, I have 200 odalists that have been analyzed. They are roughly 200 different patterns. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, there's a lot going on there. Uh, bewildering it, it, indeed. And um, what I would like to extend upon that is, is does that differential migration lead to a different experience at sea? And this is something that Dave Secor was talking about this morning. Is, is, are they different contingents? Uh, do the, the juveniles who out migrate early in the season have a completely different life experience than the juveniles who out migrate later in the season. Um, hopefully we'll be able to see something from the OLS uh, as I continue with the analysis. And lastly, um, what is the importance of the Mohawk River to this declining population? Um, they're definitely important. Uh, the Mohawk was not traditionally or was not historically available to migratory fish before the uh, advent of the Erie Canal in the 1800s. And, and even after that, with the, the water quality, it was basically a, a chemical block. In the mid-century, um, I believe Chris Knack said, the, you know, it cleaned up nicely and everybody came up. And it, it's beautiful habitat and, and the fish are using it. Um, we're going to be able to compare that to um, historically used spawning areas in the Hudson and in the other Hudson tributaries and, and see if there's anything else that we can determine about what's going on with this decline. So finally, again, you can imagine this is my PhD, so I've got a lot of stuff to do. Um, I've got a few more OLS to run from, from one of the years, literally one more slide, I'm almost done. Um, I have a couple uh, sacks of fish left in the freezer and some beautiful archive OLS that Karin has from work that she's done earlier from 1999 to 2000. Uh, we do have the scales associated with all these fish. Um, so we can look at Asian growth associated with these migration patterns. Um, I do have the uh, oxygen carbon stable isotopes that I mentioned earlier. Um, they're coming. Um, I would like to send out a little bit more muscle tissue and, and see if, if indeed that year 2013 continues to stick out weird like it, it has been. And uh, I have water samples that are associated all along the uh, Mohawk the Mohawk River and along the uh, Midland Bight to, to set up for analysis. So finally, um, thank you so much. There, there were a million people that used to have all the names on it. It's basically everyone I've ever met. Um, and uh, you know, my project has been funded by uh, SUNY ESF, by the Hudson River Foundation, uh, the DEC. Uh, I've, I've had a lot of work done with uh, the UC Davis um, Laser Laboratory. And uh, uh, thank you so much to the New York chapter and the Northeast Division for letting me be here today. <laughs>